Welcome back to Recap. QQ here as usual. So last week we left off on a cliffhanger. Gawker took down an article due to numerous complaints from numerous parties, including an email campaign aimed at their advertisers. So just a reminder, this was an article that was complicit in blackmail and outed a gay guy. But we didn't really know the full fallout of this until shortly afterwards. So the first bit of news that we got is that both Tommy Craggs and Max Reed decided to resign from Gawker, and their resignation was a direct response to the takedown of the article. One of these names should be a bit more familiar than the other. Max Reed, who was the editor-in-chief of Gawker, he was the one who wrote this lovely article. Do you remember this one? This is the one complaining about how email campaigns cost Gawker seven figures. So what was the reason that they gave for the resignation? You're not going to believe this. Here, I'll give you a hint. Actually, it's about... Yeah, that's right. They resigned because they viewed the takedown as a journalistic ethics issue. The reason for that is because the Gawker executive staff, uh, headed by Nick Denton, was the one who stepped in to remove this without the consent of the editorial team. They viewed this as a breach of the firewall between the executive teams and the editorial teams, and they viewed that as a breach of ethics. So yep, that's right. Max Reed, ex-editor-in-chief for Gawker.com, and expert in the journalistic ethics of clickbait. You can take the journalist out of the clickbait site, but you can't take the clickbait out of the journalist. On their way out, they decided to leak private memos between them and the executive staff, which were published on Gawker.com itself in a hilarious bit of schadenfreude. In the leaked memos, the information comes to light that email campaigns to advertisers honestly work. There are a few advertisers that were thinking of pulling out, and they were worried about another set of advertising losses that would approach seven figures. So this was a business decision on Nick Dutton's part that went directly against the will of the editorial team, and the editorial team screamed, ethics, ethics, and some of them had a shit fit and quit. I don't know, I can't help but find this whole situation hilarious. Another one of the revelations in the leaked memos is that Gawker Advertising President Andrew Gorenstein was openly wondering in a meeting about why Sam Biddle hadn't been fired yet. Yeah, remember Sam Biddle? Sam bring back bullying Biddle? And when Biddle was asked on Twitter why Andrew Gorenstein was pondering this, Biddle pretty much confirmed that it was over his bring back bullying tweets. So there's quite a bit of fallout from the editor-in-chief resigning, so much so that Denton branded the reopening of Gawker's doors on Monday as a complete relaunch and was even considering a rebranding because of how toxic the Gawker brand had become. Denton stated that Gawker was going to become 20% nicer. And that's an oddly specific figure. Well, he later downgraded this by saying it would only be 10-15% to 15% nicer. But even so, I mean, his heart's in the right place, right? Right? <laughs> Another announcement that Denton made is that if any of the staff was displeased with the new direction of the site, they could quit and collect full severance pay. And actually, quite a lot of the staff took him up on that offer. William Usher wrote a full piece on all the departures, but I'll go over them briefly here. Leigh Finnegan, the features editor, decided that they would leave due to this new editorial decision. Joining them was editor Dana Evans. In addition to them, Sultana Khan also left. William Arkin, who was a security writer for Gawker, also left. Although, in his angry blog post that he wrote afterwards, it sounds more like he was fired. His closing line was, We are making the world a miserable place. I'm glad I can withdraw and think about it. I'm just glad that someone is finally acknowledging what Gawker is doing to the world. So holy crap, Gawker is actually burning, Gawker is actually collapsing, Gawker is making changes to its editorial policies as a result of email campaigns. I never thought we'd see this day, I never thought we'd see this glorious of a confirmation that our actions held weight, this glorious of a confirmation of the power of the gamers. Congratulations to everyone who sent emails, you did awesome work. So our work's not over yet, there's still other publications out there like Vox Media which owns Polygon, which is a little bit more respectable than Gawker, I mean if you can measure respectability in plank lengths. 
and we should really keep our eye on them. And we should continue to keep our eye on Gawker, because I have a feeling that they'll continue to go on as a shell of its former self. But we should watch Kotaku and see what kind of shenanigans they continue to get up to. Either way, right before the one-year anniversary of Gamergate, this is cause for a party. Thanks so much for warming my heart, everyone. You did us proud. So another set of airplay updates came out, this time with a lot less drama than the last recap. So if this is the first recap that you're catching, I should explain what airplay is a little bit. So airplay is an event that the Society of Professional Journalists Region 3 and SBJ Florida are holding, organized by Michael Koretsky. It was intended to be a live stream debate between participants in the Consumer Revolt and their opponents, but since nobody opposing the Consumer Revolt is actually going to show up, some journalists are going to fill in for them. And yes, I just cropped that from my previous video because I was too lazy to repeat it again. The first update was to let us know that another member of the neutral panel had been selected. This time, it's Derek Smart, an indie developer. Derek Smart has shown himself to be pretty neutral so far. He did help uh, Short Fat Otaku and Camera Lady clear up some information in one of their videos. And he has used the hashtag uh, to promote some of his own blog posts that he thought that we would be interested in. But other than that, his involvement has mostly been that of an observer. Koretsky did highlight a rather interesting quote from Derek Smart about what he thinks of the consumer revolt. Basically, Koretsky decided to highlight a quote from Smart where he questions our tactics, basically criticizing the fact that we're leaderless and how ineffective that makes us, about how having no leaders makes it easier to be branded as a hate group, and how the actions of misfits propagate faster because of no central authority. Of course, you know that I strongly disagree with Derek Smart here. Being leaderless basically neuters some of the Alinsky tactics that those wishing to silence us like to employ so much. I mean, they're practically educated on how to use these Alinsky tactics. If we were to get leaders, then all of a sudden some of the Alinsky tactics become infinitely more effective and it would tear us to shreds. But I really wanted to highlight this quote because Koretsky was the one who selected it and decided to publish it. Hmm, think about that for a moment. The next update was largely procedural. It let us know that anyone who wanted to see airplay could go there and could ask questions if they wanted to. They'd just have to make their own travel arrangements. It also went over some of the costs that you're expected to pay, like paying for valet parking and things like that. It also clarified the schedule a bit more about what would happen at the after party, and it made John Smith the primary contact going forward for any information that you need about it. In this update, Koretsky calls us Gamer Gators again. Hmm, I'm starting to notice a pattern here. The next and final update over this period was the only one to generate any controversy whatsoever. And that's because he decided to do that thing again where he goes through tweets and emails that he's been sent and posts on 8chan and things like that and talks about them. This time he did try to highlight some of the more positive ones, but he pointed out the caveat of doing that. Basically, he doesn't want to look like he's stroking his own ego. Also, he said that he thrives on the negative attention, so he prefers to highlight that, and the insults that he gets are almost always funnier, but he did find some funny compliments too, so I have to give him credit for that. The most controversial thing in the post, though, was that he accidentally labeled Alistair Pinzoff as one of the most supportive Gamer Gators. Oh, Gamer Gators. Why? If you follow Alistair Pinzoff on Twitter at all and read the things that he posts, you'd know that he's really not that pleased with the Consumer Revolt at this point in time. I've read a lot of his complaints, and I think they come from a good place in his heart, and I can see what he's talking about, even though I don't agree with him. Really, you should go read them yourself uh, and form your own opinion on them. Anyway, after the update was released, Pinzoff made this tweet where he highlighted Koretsky's error and made a joke that he's fishing for a job at Kotaku with his piss-poor blogging and clickbait. It ended up with a big Twitter argument where Pinzoff ended up blocking Koretsky, but Pinzoff made an interesting point, and I'd like to highlight it. Pinzoff made the observation that Koretsky is using GG as a label to serve a specific narrative that Koretsky would like to push. So I do have to applaud Pinzoff for making this observation. As I said before, he's not really that hot with the actions of the Consumer Revolt right now, but he is more informed than most journalists, I would say. He does follow along and see what's going on, and he's pretty clued in. So him making this observation is something that you should think on. You should think about why he made this observation and whether you agree with this observation. The reason I highlight this is because I've kind of noticed the same thing. Again, I'm not telling you what to think. I'm just telling you that you should think.
So it's time we had a little talk about critical distance. Notice that that word critical is in their name. That should always give you pause. I've read through their mission statement before. I briefly glossed over it in one of my previous recaps, but I'm going to go through it a little bit more in depth now. As far as I can tell, Critical Distance is a journalistic endeavor where they scour the web for writings on video games that they find interesting. They state that they're not there to create a canon of best works, but that they really just want to facilitate dialogue. Yeah, there's two words that are never hypocritical, right? Facilitate dialogue. Facilitate dialogue. The types of works that they want to highlight should be made clear from their number one priority in their mission statement. Number one, critical distance aspires to be a safe space. Yep, it's exactly what you expect. It uses the word toxicity unironically even. And they also say that they're going to put content warnings around anything that could be triggering to people. Yeah, you already know what political slant the articles that they think are interesting are going to take, right? Item two on their mission statement is to promote works and voices that are not already served by the mainstream. You know what that means. Item 3 is really of most concern, though. I mean, yeah, those other two really let you know what political direction they're going to take in the articles that they select, but number 3 is the place where there's potential for journalistic impropriety. So where does Critical Distance get its money from? Well, it gets it from its readership, which means from its Patreon. A final concern is not so much what's in the mission statement as what's missing from the mission statement. What's missing is any type of mention of what I would think of as more traditional journalistic ethics, like avoiding conflicts of interests and things like that, you know, the super simple stuff. It's notably absent from their mission statement, and they don't appear to have a separate ethics policy either. But as we know from the past, people with this set of political beliefs tend to be paragons of integrity. They tend to take journalistic ethics really seriously, right? So let's take a little bit more in-depth of a look at what's been published in cooperation with Critical Distance. This was all thanks to original research by Boogie Pop Robin. So thank you, Boogie Pop Robin. You do awesome work. So first, let's go to our good friend Dan Golding. Do you remember Dan Golding? During the Gamers Are Dead Blitz, he wrote one of the first blog posts on it. One of the blog posts that everyone else kept referencing. Oh, and look, here's Dan Golding supporting Critical Distance on Patreon. I'm sure that nothing bad is going to happen, right? I mean, he's just supporting them on Patreon. They're going to keep a nice professional distance between them and Dan Golding, right? But wait, here's an article on Gama Sutra, an article in association with Critical Distance. Oh, and wait, in this article, one of Dan Golding's articles is linked without any disclosure that he's a financial supporter of them. <laughs> so they're practically promoting this guy without telling anyone that he's supporting them financially. Hmm, that sounds awfully familiar by now, doesn't it? So next is Andrew Dunn, who's also a Patreon supporter for Critical Distance. Nothing wrong with supporting a project you like, right? I mean, unless that project turns around and decides to write about you without any disclosure, like Critical Distance did in partnership with Gama Sutra, the article is titled, This Year in Video Game Criticism, The Games That Shaped 2014, and it contains some links to some of our favorite cultural critics, like Anita Sarkeesian and Jonathan McIntosh. Wait, they actually link to Jonathan McIntosh directly? Like, not through the Anita filter, just pure, unfiltered McIntosh? Wow. Exposure to unfiltered Josh McIntosh is pretty dangerous. Anyway, we're not here for Macintosh, we're here for Andrew Dunn. And sure enough, one of Andrew Dunn's writings is, is shilled out in this article. Are you starting to notice a pattern here? Next is a very familiar face, Christine Love. So we all know who Christine Love is by now, but there's another person involved in this one. This is Chris Ligman. Chris Ligman is the senior curator for Critical Distance. So while there is indication that Chris Ligman and Christine Love had a personal relationship together, it's kind of hard to get at because Chris Ligman has protected their Twitter, and you can only see half of the conversation, but there's certainly indication that there's a relationship there. But all of that pales in comparison to their financial relationship, which is pretty overt. Christine Love gave $100 to Ligman's GoFundMe in order to get to GDC. Not only that, but Love was also donating to Critical Distance on Patreon. So the combination of these personal relationships and these financial relationships make it very interesting that Chris Ligman was writing in Gama Sutra in cooperation with Critical Distance about Christine Love. Now to be fair, the Patreon relationship was only established before the last article was written. But even so, this pattern is starting to solidify itself. 
I mean, the pattern is becoming so established that I can almost just make a boilerplate for it. Daniel Parker is a Patreon supporter for Critical Distance. Three articles were published in association with Critical Distance, two in Gama Sutra, one in The New Statesman. All three of them reference Daniel Parker's work. You want to know the real sad thing, though? Here's the real sad thing. This is only a selection of the things that were found in the last two weeks involving Critical Distance. It's that bad. So critical distance, maybe you might want to think about establishing a critical distance between your writers and their subjects. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry about that one. The sad thing is, is I'm losing the ability to get mad over these things. When I first saw Internet Aristocrats videos on journalistic impropriety, I was fired up. I was pissed off. I wasn't going to shut up about it ever. But every week, Boogie Pop Robin is finding worse and worse things. I mean, this is basically a hub of nepotism right here. Critical Distance is doing this so often, they can almost be considered to be a clique of their own. And I'm not surprised. I'm not angry. So could everyone do me a favor, please? Could everyone do me a big favor? Get mad. Get pissed off. Think about it. The reason this thing is still going on is because this type of thing is rampant. It's everywhere. Not only that, but friends in high places pulled all the strings. They pulled out all the stops. They did everything in their power, used every single little dirty trick in order to make it so that we wouldn't be taken seriously. So that when we bring these serious concerns to light, that everyone can just dismiss us as being as a joke. So that we're effectively silenced. And you know, that's what pisses me off the most, is that we're effectively silenced. We can get as mad as we want, and we can just be dismissed as sexist, misogynist gamer gators. So you know what's going to happen. It's probably going to end up on Deep Freeze. But unless we keep talking about it, unless we keep rubbing it in people's faces, unless we keep bringing it up and highlighting it, putting it in our videos, putting it in our streams, putting it in our articles, it's going to be forgotten. No one's going to care about it. So stay angry. Stay vocal. Make sure everyone knows that this type of bullshit is going on. I'm sick and tired of being silenced. And I'm sick and tired of staying silent. I'm not staying silent anymore. And you shouldn't either. Anyway, that's all I have time for this recap. Thanks for joining me week after week. I really appreciate it. You're keeping me going, guys. Remember to subscribe if you like what you see and share this video around. This is a personal project to me. I think it's really important to capture a record of everything that happened because we're never going to get a fair shake from the mainstream media. So thanks for joining in this shared experience. I'll, I'll see you again next week.